Okay, today we're going to talk about another group of people, very specific people genetically, that are prone to glutathione deficiency. So why would you care? Why would I care? I'm not part of that group. Maybe you are. But having glutathione deficiency as kind of a part of your life makes you much more vulnerable to a lot of different things. This particular group of people are people with what they call G6PD deficiency. So that's glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Now we're going to say that again is G6PD deficiency, okay? They don't have the ability to make reduced glutathione and they're in deep trouble. Not only that, by not having this enzyme work very well, if it didn't work at all, they'd probably be dead. So it works a little bit. And there's a big variation from it works almost like a normal person to it doesn't work at all. And we're going to go deep into this because these people are very vulnerable to oxidative stress, but it's very specifically viral infections, bacterial infections, and a number of other things. And they represent a good portion of who we are. I don't mean just in their numbers, though this is the number one enzyme mutation in the world, discovered about 100 plus years ago. We'll get into it, okay? So these people are the canary in the gold mine for all of us. So what that means is they are hypersensitive, much more sensitive to oxidative stress than we are. And so the expression of the canary in the gold mine is gold miners, coal miners, not gold miners, coal miners went into the coal mine and the number one thing that they were afraid of most was methane gas. So they would take a cage of, of, of canary and they would keep an eye on it. There was actually a position to do nothing else but watch the canary and when the canary died, tell everybody else, ring a bell, right? And then of course telephones and so on and so forth. But the canary in the coal mine was they were, the canary was hypersensitive, much more sensitive than humans were to methane gas. It would die. Pretty straightforward. A dead canary is a dead canary. These people that have glutathione deficiency, they are much more sensitive to us to other stressors because they lack glutathione. That's a hint for us. We're going to go deep into this. So by understanding their situation, we can better learn what we need to do to protect ourselves in every flu season. We're going to use the COVID of all the research that's come out of COVID worldwide to explain this, which is a just amazing story. It helps us every flu season, every viral infection, every bacterial infection, and so on. So what is G6PD deficiency? Glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Promise I wouldn't say that again, but I am. First red cell enzyme mutation to be identified in 1932 by Otto Warburg, who is famous by for other things, namely uh, glycolysis since the Warburg effect that has to do with cancer. It proved unique in two ways. First, it's a polymorphic trait, meaning there's a lot of different variations of this. This isn't a black or white. You either got it or you don't. It's kind of a degree sort of thing, which makes it very problematic. So it's polymorphic, many shapes, many different variations of this. Worldwide, current estimates are over 500 million people. 500 million people? That's about 100 different Norways <laughs> of people that have this, but with great variation in prevalence. So from zero to Amer Indians, so the Indians of North America for the most part are very low, to very high, 32% in parts of Africa, North Africa, well, actually Africa in general, uh, Asia and Central America, as you'll see, over 200 G6PD mutations. So there's different ways that have evolved to make this advantage or problem, depending on how you look at it. It evolved against malaria. So the benefit is they can survive malaria better than people who don't have this. We'll get into that. So second is nearly all people with this trait have no disease, no signs or symptoms, until they are stressed, if you will, until they are exposed to an exogenous agent, i.e. a trigger that will cause acute hemolytic anemia. That is, the red blood cells will pop, and in essence, they bleed to death from the inside. They don't quite bleed to death, but they come very close to death. They come through this crisis, hemolytic crisis, which may be so severe, it brings me to the point of dying, and so many do die. That's the study. So it's interesting, it's an Italian Tanzania study. Both those countries have a history of this, okay? So it's all about your red blood cell, all about your red blood cell, and it's against malaria. It evolved against, not lucky, it evolved against malaria. Why is that? Malaria makes a home in humans in their red blood cells. So if you can make your red blood cell inhospitable to malaria, you will survive a malarial parasitic infestation, right? So that's the strategy. You make red blood cells unfriendly so that malaria cannot make a home in your red blood cell. But in order to make it unfriendly to malaria, which means to break it up, to make red blood cells die, 
you lose the oxygen carrying capacity to take oxygen to your brain, to your organs and so on and so forth. So you go through a very poor period of not really being able to get oxygen around. And at the same time, this enzyme is also responsible for making what they call nucleotides, which are the building blocks of your DNA. So you go through these crises. It doesn't last forever, but the idea is you make it so bad that malaria can't reproduce in you. And then you come back to life, more or less, come back as good as new in 30 to 60 days, or maybe even faster, depending. And it's most sensitive to kids, little kids, because they're still developing. So if they go without oxygen, if they go without the ability, the ability to make nucleotides or they're still developing their brain, they will get into a lot of other problems, as you can well imagine. So this is just a diagram. So glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, they have an extreme sensitivity that results in glutathione deficiency. What that means is here's the name of it, G6PD. What it does, it recharges an enzyme that recharges glutathione. Glutathione needs to be reduced. That's the only way it's effective is reduced glutathione. If it doesn't get reduced, it's not effective. So it's not just having glutathione, it's having reduced glutathione. Reduced glutathione does what? It mops up all the free radicals that are made from oxidative stress, otherwise known as ROS, reactive oxygen species. So every time you have a crisis or a stress, uh, whether it's emotional or physical or due to a viral infection or bacterial infection or an environmental exposure to a toxic element or to certain foods that you cannot tolerate. We'll get into that. Those are the things that will cause oxidative stress in a lot of free radicals. So if you can't sequester is the word, if you can't mop up the free radicals, they become so bad, they cause a lot big, uh, much bigger problems than they have to. So people die of a viral infection where other people would not die of a viral infection because they can't sequester all those free radicals. Okay, so those with G6PD deficiency cannot make reduced glutathione easily. Therefore, they're metabolically very vulnerable to anything that increases their oxidative stress, ROS, can be a trigger. When the demand for glutathione exceeds their capacity, their red blood cells break, pop. They have a hemolytic crisis resulting in loss of red blood cells for sure, severe anemia, and they'll get jaundice. You know, you'll, the blood will be spilled out in their urine and they'll become yellow eyed and so on and so forth. They will have too few red blood cells to carry oxygen around their body. This is most common enzyme mutation in the world. Over 500 million people have this today. This is an example of actual people. This was not many years ago, if you want to look up the report, but what I'm showing you, this are these are kids from seven to 12 years old, and it gives you the numbers of normal kids that are they don't have this problem, uh, kids that what they call heterozygotes, we'll talk about that, and those who are completely deficient. And so what happens, they all got malaria. So here's the malaria, P. Falciparum malaria. That's one of the types of malaria out there. It's not the only type. And so those who are normal kids, they all got sick, obviously, and then they were given an anti-malarial medication. Those who were very deficient, they had this genetic deficiency, and it's what they call a uh, X-linked recessive trait, which means women have to have it on both, men just have to have it on one. And so they go through severe crisis. They go through an absolute hemolytic crisis, hemolytic anemia. And it takes them a while to recuperate. And to the point that 11% of those that were deficient, this group down here, needed blood transfusions. Notice 11% of the boys needed uh, transfusions and a half of 1% of the girls. So there's far more men, boys, that are vulnerable to this because they just have to have it on one chromosome. Again, from the same study. So triggered by oxidative stress from infections, be it viral or bacterial, exposure to medications, certain foods, fava beans, Blueberries, red wine, all these things you heard were supposed to be good, except the fava beans. Here's just a, a picture of the world of where these canaries live. They are the canaries in the gold mine. You can see Africa, uh, Saudi Arabia is the highest, we'll see in a second, Southeast Asia, a, a little bit in North, uh, Northern South America and in um, the Caribbean. Again, Haiti, Jamaica, Nigeria, and uh, Nicaragua, right over here. But mostly it's Central Africa, think of the Congo, Think of Nigeria, uh, think of the Ivory Coast. And this is slightly, this is Italy and Greece, of course, the Mediterranean version. These are all slightly different variations. So this is not the same gene. And so that's why the 200 different genetic mutations that they have this in Southeast Asia as well. They are different variants of G6PD deficiency that provide a survival benefit to the different variants of malaria. It evolved over millions of years, absolutely. 
because malaria was the number one killer, and I believe even here of 2023, it's had that number one or number two killer in the world. It just doesn't, it's not as worldwide as it was. We're getting into that as well. Again, highest prevalence is uh, in Eastern Saudi Arabia, and after that's in Eastern uh, India, in a place called Orissus, which is right over here, parts of Southeast Asia, Laos, Thailand, and certainly part in the Solomon Islands. But malaria existed everywhere, but this particular predisposition, G6PD deficiency, existed in these areas. This was their strategy. It evolved in that these groups of people, remember people didn't move around a lot. They had to develop a defensive way to have their subsequent generations survive from malaria in order to, to, to live as a race. Map of malaria, past and present. Here's why I show you. The purple is roughly where it is today. Uh, I worked a couple of years in Indonesia, Jakarta specifically. I was in the oil field and I did get malaria and that was not a lot of fun. But so I was dead center in that area. It's kind of to be expected to get it. Though you'd think on a rig, you wouldn't get it that much. But anyway, so, but up here where you see it's in beige, this is where it existed pretty much a hundred years ago. Well, not even a hundred years ago, uh, 19, 1900s. So it's been reduced by half, but the point is, look where it used to be. It used to be all over. And here's the Amerindians, right? Here's North American. That's why they don't have this genetic. There's no G6PD here, uh, but it's strong in other areas. There's other, same strategy to, to, to kill the red blood cell almost at the point of death to prevent you being from being infected by the parasite of malaria also exists through sickle cell anemia. That's another strategy that evolved. Also evolved through thalassemia, another sort of go through a red blood cell kind of crisis. And then the next one, which is actually the newest to this uh, development and the research isn't as deep as MTHFR, which is a uh, mutation for methylation. We'll get into that later. So here we are, 150 years ago in the United States, you could have gotten malaria on the coast of Maine. Obviously it was seasonal. In New England, it's snow. So you're not gonna get malaria in the winter, but you'd get it in the steamy hot summer. So that's the difference. The seasonality areas, they got drained and dried up or the pesticides, whatever was needed, it doesn't exist there. But 150 years ago, it was all over the place. It was the thing that everybody died from more than anything else. Okay, global pre prevalence today. Here is the equator. That's what that yellow line is. It's a slightly different map. And it shows that pretty much it's around the equator Southeast Asia, right? There's Indonesia, South America. So it shows the Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, and how it changed. So the most common genetic enzyme mutation in the world, and this is, this, so the woman, a girl, female, has to have it on both chromosomes. They would be homozygous. And, but since they, there's so many different genetic mutations for it, you could actually have two genes for G6PD deficiency on the same chromosome. So that would be what they call double hemi. Zygous. So you'd have homozygous would be the same mutation on both chromosomes. Hemizygous is having two different genes on one chromosome. So it gets a little confusing. That's why there's this big range between, you know, G6PD doesn't work at all. You can't make the nucleotides and you certainly can't recharge your glutathione. You're stuck versus not so bad. But the toxins are naphthalene, mothballs, salicylic acid, aspirin, common aspirin, red wine, fava beans, all legumes. So legumes are the pea family. It's peanuts, it's peas, it's, I can't think of more legumes, but they're out there, you know that. And so men are the most susceptible because they just need it on one chromosome. Homozygous woman has it on both chromosomes. Hemizygous, they just have it on one chromosome. So they're not heterozygous, they're hemizygous. And here's a heterozygous uh, male has it on one chromosome. Here's a homozygous male has it on both chromosomes. And here's a hemizygous male has it on just one chromosome. So the activity level of red blood cells, activity level meaning 100% they can carry all this oxygen, zero, they're dead. So they have G6PD activity level from 30 to 80%. 80% is considered normal. That's be the dark red cells. 30% obviously is abnormal. And likelihood of severe hemolysis. It's for those over there. So these people are highly vulnerable to COVID. It's one of the events that causes a lot of oxidative stress, right? Think of the cytokine storm we've heard about that comes in when you, or think of any cold or flu that you've had. First, you feel lousy. You're getting you know, congested, your body aches. You just got to go to sleep. That's when you're getting the oxidative stress. That's when it's happening. And so at that point, those who are worst off with the G6PD deficiency can't control that. That stage doesn't go away. It hangs on and it gets worse and worse and worse, as we'll see. 
So because of their limited ability to produce glutathione, they become by default glutathione deficient. What they did, here was an actual by luck study, it happened in New York. So what they did when nothing else works for a hospitalized G6PD deficient person with severe COVID. The problem with G6PD, because there's so many variations, a lot of people don't know if they're G6PD deficient because they've been doing okay. Maybe there's some times it felt a little odd or, but they didn't know. It's not like they have an armband and it's not, and unless they're tested specifically for it, they're not going to know. So what happened here is that these people were doing very poorly and from a paper called Therapeutic Blockade of Inflammation in Severe COVID-19, 2020. This is really at the beginning of the pandemic. And in short, they were given what they couldn't make for themselves and they dramatically recovered. So what that means is they were given glutathione. They were given IV NAC, which is a precursor for glutathione. And suddenly, I'll just read it out. So uh, G6PD deficiency facilitates human coronavirus infection. When they say facilitates, it means they have no resistance. They can't turn off that first stage, the cytokine storm. And so often when G6PD people and or people with COVID, they're given in certain places hydrochloroquine. Hydrochloroquine is also an anti-lamellarial medication. You sound, well, wouldn't that be a good thing for these people who evolved against, to have a strategy against malaria? The problem is hydroxychloroquine, like a lot of other malarial medications, the ones that were used for, for COVID, were pro-oxidant therapies, which benefited some people a lot. But for these people, more oxidation is not what they could take and it would almost kill them. And some it did kill actually. What they did is they described a severe case of a G6PD patient where they was treated hydroxychloroquine. So not only they're doing bad from COVID, they're doing bad from hydroxychloroquine, they're doubly bad. And somebody had the bright idea of giving them IV NAC, pump in the NAC, the glutathione. And so the NAC blocked the hemolysis. It stopped the breaking down of the red blood cells. It stopped the increasing liver enzymes. It stopped the increasing CRP, which is an inflammatory marker. It stopped the rising of the ferritin, which is another inflammatory marker, and allowed the removal of the respirator and got them off of what they call ECMO. It's kind of like brought them back from the dead. And it's like, oh my gosh, what happened? So then they started giving IV to everybody regardless of whether they're G6PD deficient or not, and here's what happened. They then gave it to a nine additional respirator dependent, but without G6PD deficiency, and it elicited clinical improvement, markedly reduced CRP in all patients, and in to nine out of 10 patients. Not as dramatic as the G6PD, and here it is. IV NAC given to COVID patients across the board, they kind of all improved, um, but the, those who improved the most were the G6PD patients. So. That was like, hmm, why don't we just do this? And so they did it with the person who needed it the most, but they get, did it to everybody. It's like, they all got better. Whoa, that was something. Great study. So what happens if cells lack an ADPH, which is the thing that G6PD recharges? So here we go. We have G6PD over here. It doesn't work. Ordinarily, G6PD would whip over and give an enzyme, an enzyme. It would give an electron to NADP which would turn around and give it to glutathione and keep glutathione re reduced all the time. Well, it couldn't get an electron from G6PD. It couldn't give it to glutathione to reduce it. It was stuck, nothing happened, and things got worse badly, quickly. Okay, basically it happened in this, these steps. Consequently, step one is they're G6PD deficient. I got that. Well, their NADPH goes down. That's the thing that takes the electron. Consequently, their decreased antioxidant activity. It means basically decreased glutathione, right? Glutathione can't be recharged. Consequently, reactive oxygen species, right? Oxidative stress goes up, 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 up. And excessive oxidative stress, that's all step one. It's not getting good. It's not doing, it's not going well for these guys. But what is also a side, another bad aspect of this is when you're low in glutathione, glutathione is kind of like the electricity to the liver. It's the thing that makes the liver really be able to spin all of its different functions of detoxification and making new, for instance, nucleotides and so on. Well, when there isn't any glutathione, reduced glutathione, your liver can't convert vitamin D very well. So suddenly your vitamin D is less effective and it's less converted. Specifically, it comes down to this. There's less vitamin D receptors, so they can't grab on to enough vitamin D, can't use the vitamin D, and there's decreased vitamin D binding proteins. So the net is less active vitamin D. Vitamin D goes from the liver to the kidney. The kidney 
has also a problem. So you've really decreased the activity of vitamin D. Now you've compounded the whole situation. So now we go on to step three, which is you have decreased glutathione, reduced glutathione. You have excessive reactive oxygen species, way big <laughs> oxidative, oxidative stress, and decreased vitamin D. Oh my gosh, what happens then? You're just, you're done. So you have metabolic immune inflammatory dysfunction. More than likely you're headed to a thing called advanced respiratory distress. You're probably gonna be living on the respirator and on ECMO, which is kind of a heart lung machine in a way. And the viral infection is gonna get worse and you'll probably get a bacterial infection on top of it. So that's how this all goes. Started off with not having enough reduced glutathione is the point here. So the reality of the last 70 years for all of us, we have become more like these G6PD deficiency people. We've become more like them. We've become more like the canary in the minefield, right? The sensitive, they're hypersensitive. We're keeping an eye on that cage. We're going, oh my gosh, these guys are really having a problem. In that we are all borderline glutathione deficient to some extent. Remember I showed you as we get older, our glutathione goes down, it gets lower and lower and lower. So we all are very much becoming like the G6PD deficient individual and their vulnerabilities. So when exposed to a significant stressor, oxidative stressor, like COVID, we don't have the glutathione to handle it. Again, step one, huge amount of uncontrolled oxidative stress leads to under-functioning of being able to convert vitamin D, both in the liver and in the kidneys. So now we have decreased vitamin D. Then that goes into excess oxidative stress, decreased glutathione, decreased vitamin D, and there we go to a life on the respirator in further viral infections, if not death. So what it looks like is this. We have the exposure, the virus, then we have a viral infection, and the viral load increases. We have viral replication, and it keeps on going on and on and on. We get to advanced respiratory distress, ARDS, and it leads to death, like it did in COVID. Simply put, it looks like this. Reduced glutathione deficiency. So you can think of G6PD deficiency, or you can think of all of us as we're gradually getting older. There's things we can do about it. That's why I'm telling you this story. Leads to vitamin D deficiency effectiveness. Even though we're taking vitamin D, it's not as effective because we can't convert it. We can't, as I've described, and we have excessive reactive oxygen species. Together, that leads to metabolic inflammatory dysfunction. So this is that same study, IV, NAC, and G6PD. IV NAC is a remarkable benefit to those for it for COVID, for severe COVID. It helped stop the breakdown of the red blood cells, the hemolysis, and the G6PD deficient patient who is COVID infected, treated by hydroxychloroquine, which was a pro-oxidant medication. It was the wrong medication to give those people. They probably didn't know they were G6PD deficient. So the NAC administered allowed the patient to be taken off ventilation and discharged to their home. They just came back from the dead, came back from the dead, said, you know, I think I'll go home. I'm doing okay. <laughs> Can you imagine that? All right, next. <laughs> In red blood cells, G6PD is essential to produce NADPH. NADPH is the thing that recharges glutathione. It does other things as well, but it recharges glutathione, which is used to regenerate glutathione from oxidized glutathione. The depletion of reduced glutathione in these people, in these cells, can be reversed by NAC. This is the study that's saying this. So G6 deficiency can vary in severity based on specific genetic polymorphisms. There's many various types. Okay, so now we're getting into what I consider the COVID studies yearbook 2020 to show you, to wrap all this up by saying all these studies that are coming in from around the world, from context, cultural context is in countries saying, we just have to take care of the people in front of us. We can't wait for a vaccine to show up or some sort of you know treatment on high that is told this is what they had to figure it out. So all this data is coming in and we're getting studies saying, you know, glutathione seems to be this theme. What is this thing? So this is what we're gonna go into. And notice, so the potential link between G6PD deficiency, oxidative stress, vitamin D deficiency, and racial inequalities in death rates associated with COVID. US 2020 virus infection triggers massive reactive oxidative stress production and oxidative damage. You now know that, right? Reduced glutathione, this is from the study, reduced glutathione is essential to protect the body from oxidative damage due to excessive ROS free radicals. Reduced glutathione is also required to maintain vitamin D metabolism genes and circulating levels of vitamin D, 25-OH, that's the form that comes from a vitamin D that comes from the liver, it goes to the kidney. So G6PD as an enzyme is necessary to prevent the depletion of reduced glutathione. 
That's from G6PD and COVID study, the yearbook. G6PD deficiency individuals are vulnerable to excessive, this is another study, excessive to oxidative stress. They have greater risk for deficiency of vitamin D and damage from COVID-19. Pretty straightforward. An association between interstitial lung disease with vitamin D deficiencies and glutathione, reduced glutathione's deficiency has been previously reported before COVID. So this is their theory they're coming to, saying we believe that the overproduction of reactive oxygen species, excessive oxidative damage, is responsible for the impaired immunity, the cytokine storm, the pulmonary, lung dysfunction from COVID viral infection in C and G6PD deficiency. Absolutely. So the co-optimization of increasing glutathione where there wasn't any and increasing vitamin D where there wasn't any would have the potential to reduce oxidative stress, incre increase their immunity, and reduce adverse clinical effects of COVID-19. Absolutely. So the take-home message with all that jargon there is that increase your glutathione and increase your vitamin D. This is a big deal. So this is how most of the world had to respond to the crisis, had to figure this out, and they were all watching each other's papers. Oh, this came from here, this, you know, and they had to think on their feet for a period of two to three years. So this study from Taiwan in 2021 from the G6PD and COVID studies yearbook, as I'm calling it, is it is pretty impressive, if you ask me. So G6PD deficiency and in viral infections, implications for COVID, pretty straightforward, right? Okay, it's saying G6PD deficient individuals may experience a hemolytic crisis. Their red blood cells are going to pop and they're going to be in bad trouble because of the viral infection, because of COVID, after being exposed to oxidants or infection. Individuals with G6PD deficiencies are more susceptible to coronavirus infections than individuals without G6PD deficiency. Makes sense. An altered immune response to viral infections is found in individuals with G6PD deficiency. G6PD deficiency is a predisposing factor to COVID-19. This was not known before COVID, before the pandemic. It might, it might have been thought about, well, they're a little more sensitive. You know, they tend to have their situation if they're stressed and they go through red blood cell crisis, a hemolytic crisis. Here it's saying these people are different. If you treat them like everybody else, you may well kill them. And they're saying it is a predisposing factor. Be careful. Identify these people. All right. Now another study from Saudi Arabia, which is interesting because it's the highest incidence of G6PD in the world, Saudi Arabia. G6PD deficiency in COVID-19 pandemic. Ghost within the ghost. Hydroxychloroquine, which is a malaria medicine, also been used a lot outside of the United States in uh, for COVID, has a oxidative properties that could decrease glutathione levels and may cause severe hemo, uh, hemolysis in G6PD deficient patients and vitamin C as well, which is a pro-oxidant therapy. So this was not known. Now they're saying these are different people. Uh, clearly they have a self-interest, you know, because they have the highest incidence in the world. So they're, they should be the specialists in the world of knowing about this. So this 2008 Chinese study, that's now 10 years, 11 years before the pandemic. They're saying, you know, we looked at G6 phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency and found out it enhances coronavirus from an earlier time. So what they said is, hey, G6 PD deficient people are really sensitive to coronaviruses. And here's the one is specific. They did ex vivo. So they did it in cells. They didn't do it in people. But they said they found that alpha lipoic acid, which is like NAC and it's like glutathione, they're all sulfur thiol products if you want to, decrease the vulnerability of G6PD deficient cells. So, so Saudi Arabia said, we're going to use that. So 11 years later, if not 12 years later, they're looking at the research because now it's a an emergency. You know, all hands on deck. We need to get every piece of information that's relevant for the people in our country that are doing poorly. And they found out the G6 PD deficient people in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East were doing poorly. So they took ALA, alpha lipoic acid, and they proposed it as a treatment for severe acute respiratory syndrome. So these are the people already on the ventilators. These are the people on ECMO. These are the people coming pretty close to death. The point is 13 years later, this is finally being considered as valid information. 13. So before it was just like, huh, why don't we study this? That's interesting. Now it's like, let's get all this information together and find out what's going on. The possible role of G6PD 
in SARS-CoV-2 infection. From Mexico, 2022. Now we're in the third year of the pandemic. The COVID Studies Yearbook 2022, G6PD and COVID Studies. The G6PD deficient patient exposed to SARS-CoV-2, which is the was the virus then, the amount of N NADPH is reduced. So now you know why it's reduced, right? G6PD, it doesn't work. It's like wheels on a car that aren't turning. That means everything that needed to have those wheels turn aren't going to work. I told you about that. Loss of reduced glutathione is resulting in severe pneumonia and fatal outcomes. So now they're saying these people, not only do they get ARDS, right, respiratory distress syndrome, but they get pneumonia, which now means it's a bacterial infection on top of the viral infection, and they're soon going to die. So what we learn by knowing about G6PD deficiency? That NAC and reduced glutathione can save lives. You could throw in ALA as well. Less information on that, but it's becoming a new thing. It's not that new. Again, it's not that new. It's becoming a new applied thing. Coming up next, the study that turned the COVID world on its head, the ripple that became a tsunami by daring to speculate a nutrient deficiency was the key to all negative COVID outcomes, a single nutrient deficiency. Amazing. Till then. So if this is something that you're interested in, that is a topic that I obviously go deeper in, in terms of labs, in terms of how to do it, in terms of why you would want to do it, various topics, as you've seen that I've done in the past, then please let me know below in a comment. Till then.